We're just about ready to get underway with our next speaker, uh, Ed Spivak. I'm very excited to have uh, our next speaker here with us. He's a uh, very accomplished uh, scientist. He's with the St. Louis Zoo, and he's the director of uh, invertebrate uh, at the St. Louis Zoo, as well as I think, some of the, the pollinator uh, conservation uh, initiatives. So please, uh, please welcome Ed Spivak. So what I'm going to talk about, first of all, I want to thank the, uh, the Center of Agroforestry and Mizzou for inviting me. I also want to thank all of the previous presenters because a lot of what they've talked about, I will be tying into this talk. This is basically a case study of everything that has been discussed this morning. This is a brand new project we've undertaken at the uh, St. Louis Zoo, and it gives you a flavor for how you need to really think holistically, an ecosystem approach, culturally. Uh, it's not just one size fits all, and thinking about all the moving parts and how they're going to work together. First off, I want to preface it by making sure that you know that the zoo does conservation outside of its fences. Many people don't realize that zoos actually do conservation. I find that strange being doing this for the past 35, 36, no, 37 years. Um, but the St. Louis Zoo, we have a number of programs outside of, Saint, uh, outside of the zoo's fence. We are currently working or supporting projects throughout the world in a variety of areas. And some, one program that I head up, which is the Center for Native Pollinator Conservation, we have programs located from within the zoo boundaries to the city, to the region, to the state, to national, international. So I've defined it as a Center for Native Pollinator Conservation because it de neither defines the pollinator nor the location. So it gives me much more flexibility. And that's what has happened with this uh, center. We have been able to kind of spread our wings a little bit and also tie some of the other programs that we're working with around the world. So this project is focused in Amboseli National Park and the surrounding agroecosystem. So you're going to see a number of maps to really kind of give you an idea of what's going on and also the habitat. We've seen a few maps earlier how we need to deal with landscape issues, and this is uh, a big one. So here is Kenya in East Africa. Amboseli ecosystem is in the southern portion. The dark green is the national park itself, and surrounding it are group ranches. The major culture in this area are the Maasai, and we'll talk about again the Maasai are traditionally pastoralists. Cattle is a sign of wealth. It's also a sign of status. Um, they believe that every cow in the world was actually given to the Maasai. So it is very important for their culture. So utilizing the surrounding area for uh, pastoralism, and you also have areas of arable land, arable agriculture too. Amboseli National Park itself is kind of the poster child for national parks, and particularly for Kenya, backed by, whoops, ooh, Backed by Mount uh, Kilimanjaro, you have this incredible diversity of wildlife from giraffe to various antelope species. You have that vast expanse of plains. You have incredible uh, diversity of bird life. A lot of people go there for birding. These actually are bee eaters, by the way, little bee eaters. And they're incredibly well known for their elephants. They've had a long-term program looking at elephant research going back to the 1970s. And this will actually play into this whole program again because of the elephant motif. When Amboseli National Park was created, it was established a little bit differently than we tend to think about national parks as just set aside either for their beauty, for uh, particular wildlife, um, or some cultural aspect. Amboseli, and it was particularly due to the work of David Western, who was working through, um, at that time, New York Zoological Society, now Wildlife Conservation Society. He felt that the only way that Amboseli could survive is including the Maasai as part of it. There has to be that cultural and social component in order for that park to survive because that is an incredibly important part <clears throat> of their grazing rights. And if you do not include the local people, and what I'm telling you are all these aspects which when we start looking at projects throughout the US, North America, anywhere, everything I'm going to be touching on almost 
is completely applicable to a lot of the programs we're starting to talk about. So just kind of think of that in the back of your mind. So in this particular case, for the park to survive, you have to include the local people as part of its management. And in 1991, it was declared by UNESCO as a managed biosphere reserve, which was to preserve both the biodiversity, but also the local populations in its sustainable use. And sustainable use is incredibly important for this whole area. So we tend to think about when you go into a national park, whether here, you know, going to Yellowstone, um, Glacier, you tend to just see native wildlife. Here you're seeing zebra and wildebeest, but you do see goats and you do see cattle for the Maasai. This is an incredibly important area during the dry season for additional forage. And since the Maasai have been there so long, it's actually now realized that this sort of grazing structure is incredibly important for maintaining the habitat. So these uh, domesticated grazers are also part of managing that whole ecosystem too. But it is a working habitat. It's incredibly important when water resources are limited. In many parts of Africa, water resources are very limited. So when you have these areas, particularly marshes within Amboseli, um, it is important not just for the native wildlife, whether it be wildebeest, hippos, even elephants, which is the most intriguing thing to see an elephant looking like basically lawn ornament. You can buy these, you know, like a design Toscana where you have something in your lawn where there's no legs, but all you see are the backs of elephants in these marshes. But it is still a working habitat. So you can see wildebeest, elephant, and cattle grazing in the background. So this is incredibly diverse, and it's incredibly important that the local people are part of this project. When you start looking at how they've gazetted the various areas, you do have those areas which specifically just for wildlife tourism. The group ranches, which I mentioned before because of the tradition of pastoralism of the Maasai, but then you also have arable agricultural zone too, specifically for cultivated crops, though there are going to be cultivated crops throughout various areas, but specifically for this zone. As I mentioned, the Maasai traditionally are pastoralists, but they have had to change over time, as we all have had to change. You know, our ancestors basically were all farmers. I still have farmers in my family. Uh, my great, my grandfather, his brothers, they were all farmers. We don't have that rural background anymore. We've had to diversify. Many of us have come to cities. So the Maasai have also diversified too, and many of them are actually becoming agriculturalists planting crops. So they do still have their cattle, but they also are planting crops. And this is where we got involved with this particular project. To give you a little bit of background in Kenya agriculture, it is not as, I'd say, robust as it we have here in the United States. Agriculture is the second largest contributor for Kenya's gross domestic product after the service sector. So it's incredibly important. But about half of total agricultural output is for non-marketed subsistence production. Local people rely on this to survive. Nearly 75% of Kenyans are working in agriculture. This is what we used to be you know, not too long ago. But only 8% of the land is really good arable land. If you expand that to marginally, you get about 15% of the entire country, which is really good, quote unquote, for agriculture that we tend to think about. So we need to figure out how to make the most and best use of the limited resources that they have. And because of that sort of limited resource, just as in this country, every country, there's a potential of soil erosion and deforestation, which are incredibly important for sustaining those agricultural systems. There are numerous crops which are dependent upon pollinators. Some are either enhanced, when you look at things like uh, coffee, coffee is either self or wind pollinated depending upon the species, but you can increase yields with bees present of upwards of 20%. This is really kind of the list of food resources, uh, non-wind pollinated, that are grown in Kenya. You can see some are native, many of them are exotic, but the native bees have taken to them and we also should mention, too, that one of their native bees is the honeybee, unlike us. In the area that we're starting our work in, in the Kamana area, major 
production is in tomatoes, melons, carrots, red onions. Red onions are big too, which I just kind of seemed odd to me why red onions. But um, you have a lot of small time agriculture. We actually arrived when, we, uh, when I was there in November during market day, so you had all of this produce put out. But it's incredibly important for the local farmers. So we started this project for the initial funding, specifically focused on things that Mike was talking about. We want to look at what is the bee composition. We really have no idea. Here in Missouri, due to the work of Mike and others, we have a good idea of what the bees are, maybe not everything that they're doing. In places like Kenya, we don't have an idea of what's going on. In places like Amboseli National Park, actually in no national park in Kenya, do we have an idea of what the bees are. Those bees are the cornerstone of ecosystem services and maintaining those habitats. So we're going to be looking at species composition, diversity, identifying the main food plants, and just as we're doing here and many of us are doing with um, outside of this venue, helping people identify and learn the value. As I say, ignorance, and I say ignorance, my strict sense, lack of knowledge, is not the purview of the United States. It happens all over the place. When we talk to people in Kenya, they also may just know the honeybee, <laughs> but nothing else. And they don't necessarily understand pollination and the role of pollination services. So whether it's honeybees or small carpenter bees, you have this diversity which we're trying to find out and working with the local farmers as to how best to utilize this resource and how to incorporate them into their agricultural systems. So surveying is incredibly important. We're surveying both within the crop fields. This is an organic uh, green pepper uh, farm. We're also surveying within national parks. Now this is one where Mike probably doesn't have this issue. We need to have a ranger present because there is the potential of elephants, lions, hyenas, buffalo, other potential problems that you don't tend to encounter when you're just going out sweeping or putting out bee bowls. Um, the bee bowls are a big problem too. If you're unfamiliar with bee bowls, it's a, uh, a remote way of sensing. You basically put a colored bowl, kind of looks like a flower, the bees come in and unfortunately drown. But now you have to worry about elephants drinking them, destroying them, any other wildlife. Um, I've had white-tailed deer do this here, but now we have a whole list of uh, species which becomes much more problematic. I have a background also working with mammals as well as bees. This doesn't bother me, but my colleague Mary Gakungu on the right from Jomo Kenyatta University and National Museums of Kenya, she had a, has a lot of trepidation when she sees lions and elephants and it's like, you know, Eddie, are we going to be able to sample bees? And say, yeah, we can do this, it's no problem, we just have to do it this way. And says, but we do need to have an armed guard in these particular situations. With any project, whether it's here in Amboseli, anywhere in the States, anywhere in the world, buy-in is incredibly important. That initial education of why you're doing it, what's going on. So for this project, we met with the district commissioner of the county who really had no idea uh, anything about bees. Uh, we also met with the uh, heads of agriculture, the heads of the water district, and it was an education for them. Oh, I had no idea that bees did this. Oh, I didn't know that they were so important for agriculture. Having that buy-in from government officials is incredibly important, and also having those local connections. The gentleman on the left is our main Maasai uh, contact, um, Mr. Ole de Pau. He is an elder and chief and incredibly well-connected. Um, he actually became a chief just last May, and. President Uhuru Kenyatta came to his, um, I'm not even sure what you actually call it, chiefdom, chiefing, becoming a chief. Um, he's, and, and as our driver said, this is one wealthy Maasai. He has one ranch of 350 cattle, but he also has an incredibly uh, beautiful ranch that is just for agriculture purposes. There's actually one tree with honeybees, which has been there for probably 50, 60 years. So, he is also very interested in his people. What can we do to help his people survive 10 years, 20 years? 
looking long term is what we're all thinking about. And particularly when we deal with forestry systems where you can't just plant like wildflowers and hopefully next year you get some activity, you're looking at a long term commitment. We also met with the Maasai elders and chiefs who are predominantly ranchers because that is a major component of that ecosystem and how we're going to work with them. We also are going to be serving those because understanding that their grazing practices affect the habitat and the bees are also going to affect the quality of that grazing land too. So this is going to be incredibly important for them. So getting that buy-in was incredibly important for any project, getting people to understand why you're doing it. And as I said, these are cattle people or government officials. They had no idea about bees. So that is the first step. We are now going to be doing training programs with the rangers. We also, uh, the chief warden of the park has bought into the project. So that initial buy-in is incredibly important for any projects we deal with. Meeting with the farmers. They understood the value of agriculture. They didn't necessarily understand the value of the bees for their agriculture. But meeting a number of them, and this is not consistent, just as not consistent through any agricultural system, that they realize for long-term sustainability that they have to diversify. They're not thinking necessarily for the ecosystem services. They're thinking of economics. They're thinking of what different crops they're going to ma be maintaining. Conventional agriculture, as we tend to envision it, cannot work here. You cannot have these large monocultures for a variety of reasons I'll point out. It just is going to be so disruptive on the habitat and the other wildlife that it doesn't work. So they understand that you need to diversify. Uh, this particular farmer, he grew um, melons, he grew peppers, he grew tomatoes, he grew papaya, he grew citrus. He also had hogs too, which, you know, I've been to Africa now this is actually my 10th trip to different parts of Africa. You don't tend to see pigs, but he had rare heirloom varieties, <laughs> rare breeds of pigs, and there is a market for them in the country too. So he's incredibly diversified. He understands the value of diversifying that. So now individuals like this are more or less an easy sell to talk about the diversity of pollinators and how they're going to hopefully increase their production. Because one thing we need to look at is since we only have 8% arable land, we cannot really expand. We need to get the biggest bang for the buck from that area. We need to help increase production. As Lauren pointed out, that for certain crops it's not necessarily going to work, but for other crops we can potentially increase because with that increase they don't tend to think about, I need to expand and try to raise more income for myself. Water is an incredibly limiting resource. It is very ephemeral. You have a wet and a dry season. We don't have that here in the States. So some of these wells are fairly deep. Um, you do have the swamp areas within the Amboseli National Park and outside, but these are also ephemeral. There's actually a lake within Amboseli National Park, which is an ephemeral lake. So when we were there this past November, it's nothing but basically a salt flat. At another time of the year, it will be several feet deep. So they need to look at the best use of that water and also which crops are going to be best in that sort of system. So they're not necessarily water intensive. All of this goes into an overall plan which was developed through the Kenyan Wildlife Service and others, which is the Amboseli Ecosystem Management Plan. We initially went into this project looking at improving agriculture, helping the local people. But when you actually look at the long-term plan, everything really ties into this. Sustainable land, not increasing agricultural land, utilizing water resources more effectively, um, all of these things play into this overall plan for the site. So it really works well with the government's initiatives. One of the government's plans is also increasing beekeeping. So, this is also what we're going to be doing long term too. And whether it's traditional log hives, which are you find hung from different acacia trees, to Kenyan top bar hives, to a few langstroths around, but having that production and also uh, meloponic culture, stingless bee culture, which we don't have here. Some stingless bees are wild, but many of them can also be maintained in hives. Uh, they are an incredibly co important component for 
tropical and subtropical areas around the world. So these particular groups of bees, understanding and how to maintain them in part to produce honey as an additional economic benefit. This has been started in some areas of Kenya, like in the Kakamega Forest and the Central Highlands, but looking at getting more and more honey as a local resource for both local people, but also as an economic benefit, because as many of you know, honey has sort of a terroir. Depending upon where it's grown and what flower, floral resources, it has a very different flavor. So this can be marketed in other parts of both Kenya and even outside of Kenya based upon the floral resources. One of the most important floral resources is acacia. So getting people to understand that you need to save these trees in order to produce honey, in order to maintain the bees, in order to produce pollination for your crops. So trees are an intricate part of the entire system. This system cannot really survive without acacia, trees, and shrubs. It's going to be an education program for the local people too. This individual farmer, he has a, as I mentioned, a green pepper plant, a green pepper farm. His is completely organic. Um, he just realized that too much use of pesticides isn't good, isn't healthy for the environment, etc. He also has various hedgerows. He didn't actually put them in specifically for bees. It was an incredible diversity of bees when we started looking. He actually did it just to delineate his property from the next. But now, looking at traditional methods of uh, land division can actually be used as a resource for the pollinators, which is going to affect his habitat. The one problem he has right now is that he's right next to a tomato farm, which is not organic. Uh, this tomato farm, uh, they say they spray various insecticides and fungicides approximately every two to three weeks. I don't know any farmer that literally want, would want to do that, but they had piles of empty bottles and bags, and one common one, diadem, which is also systemic, uh, if you actually read the label, it can be used on tomatoes for processing or tomatoes for feel, fresh consumption, but prior to commencement of flowering. So here you see piles of empty pesticide, fungicide, bags all over, and they're actually collecting them right now for harvest. So they're spraying at the wrong time. So there's still that component where people think, oh, this is important, we need to spray. So it's going to be an education process because this uh, dynadem is also incredibly toxic to bees. So they are growing a pollinator dependent plant and spraying it with a pesticide which kills bees. So, and during times when they're harvesting and sending it to market. So there are a number of things working with education that are going to be important for working with the local people. It also means working in the local languages too. So whether it is in English or Kiswahili or Ma, which is the language of the Maasai. So getting people to understand the value uh, it's amazing when I go to places like this and they get surprised that yeah, a Wazungu, a white man, actually speaks Swahili. Swahili. Is that? Well, I'm a firm believer of wherever you're working, you should know the, the native language, whether it's southern Missouri or <laughs> places like Kenya. Get to know the language and the people. One of the areas where we don't tend to concern ourselves, but as we start looking at our agricultural systems, and particularly as was brought up with the monarchs, we need to start thinking of corridors. Ambicelli is part of an entire corridor system. We're looking at agricultural lands, as Scott mentioned with the Keystone uh, Initiative. You know, you're looking at major corn and soybean areas, which are the major breeding ground for the monarch butterflies. That is also a corridor going from Canada south. We tend to think of smaller corridors here in Abacelli. It's much larger corridors. You have these areas going in and out of the park itself to Chiulu, Savo West, and going right through agricultural areas. So here are the Kamana small holdings where we're working right now, but as a major migratory route to other areas. So they need to be concerned about what those, the wildlife is. It may be giraffe but it is also elephants. So 
understanding the value of this wildlife. As I mentioned, for GDP for Kenya, agriculture is the second largest component. But tourism is 20% of their international trade. It is the largest component of their international trade. Amboseli is one of the most visited parks within Kenya itself. So it's incredibly important that they understand the value of the elephants, the lions, the giraffe, etc., because the monies also brought into the national park are also distributed to the local communities too. So working with an agricultural system which allows for these migratory patterns, whether here in this country something as simple as migratory birds, waterfowl, monarchs, or someplace in Kenya where you have elephants, lions, etc., how do you work with them? How do you in maintain your agricultural production with something we don't tend to think about? One way to do it, particularly when you've got elephants coming through and feeding on your crops, and literally you can lose an entire year's worth of crop production with just one herd of elephant coming in. And luckily there are methods one method has been the beehive fence. Lucy King, who developed the beehive fence, actually uh, got an award from the United Nations on how to get wildlife and people working together. So there are various ways of doing it, whether it's using a top bar hive, a Langstroth hive, a log hive. Just like we have this weird fear, I think slightly overblown, of Africanized bees, Though if you go to Arizona, New Mexico, West Texas, Southern California, that's what you got. Uh, you work with them a little more slowly, um, but that's what you have. Well, we tend to freak out. Elephants also don't like the sound and don't like to be attacked. Even though you think of elephants with thick skin, it's very sensitive. So if they disturb a hive and you have thousands of bees coming out, it doesn't make elephants happy too. So this is a very simple way that both increases your pollination services, it allows you to gain an income from not just the pollination services, but also from honey production, and keeping animals like elephants out of your crops so you don't actually lose an entire year's worth of income as they come and are crop raiders. So looking at a system like this, I look at this program that we're doing here in Amboseli as one that has ramifications not just within Kenya um, or Amboseli, which we actually are looking at expanding this throughout Kenya and possibly throughout East Africa. How do you work with the local people, the local culture, and seeing people, as I said, wanting to do what's right for the environment and looking at 10, 20 years down the road, how many farmers do we know that sometimes don't look five years down the road? To look 10 years, 20 years to sustain their culture, to sustain their agriculture, and how do we do that in order to make a livelihood for themselves, maintain their cultural aspect, maintain their cultural identity, and really creating a more holistic and uh, an environment that is actually beneficial for tourists, expatriates, as well as local people. We don't tend to think about that. We need to look holistically in our systems too, whether we're looking at the agricultural belts in the central US or even around some of our national parks, how do we best manage those in order to include everybody? Oftentimes we have this conflict that really doesn't need to happen if we have that educational component right up hand, talking to people why it's needed, how many people do we know that don't understand the value of bees or think that every bee is a honeybee? So, this is also incredibly important for us, for the Kenyans, in order to maintain sustainable agriculture. And in this particular system, as I mentioned, the trees are incredibly important because they are really the major pollinating sources, uh, the major nectar sources for honey production. They are the uh, sustainers for the elephants. They are what is also maintaining that ecosystem, um, incredibly deep roots, maintaining the water table, so looking at increasing production, reducing the expansion of agricultural land,
reducing pesticides, which is also a major concern in dealing with groundwater pollution, increasing incomes, all of these tie together. And looking at this, as I said, I thank all of the previous uh, presenters because all of everything that they've been talking about really ties into a project like this where we can really look at long term what is our effect on communities, on people, on habitat. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Ed. <clears throat> we do have a, a few minutes for questions. Uh, if there are any questions for Ed. You're all just blown away. So, wow. wow. I wish I could go to Africa. <laughs> Um, right now, yeah, the question was, how many species do we have right now? Actually, we're sampling right now, um, actually this month. Uh, in this particular area, we really have no good idea. Um, most of the surveys have been done by people like Dino Martins up in the North and Jacana area, America Kungu and Kakamega in the Highlands. Um, it's an incredibly diverse and different uh, bee fauna that we have here. For example, there are no bumblebees. There are no bumblebees south of the Sahara, but an incredible diversity of carpenter bees. So whereas we unfortunately only have one species of large carpenter bee here, Kenya, you've got 12. Sub-Saharan Africa, you've got about 121 species of large carpenter bees. These are some of the major pollinators. We tend to just complain about them putting a hole in our deck, soffits, and fascia, where it's incredibly important to maintain them, particularly for agricultural systems there. Yes, I have a question for you. Uh -huh. uh, you've been talking a lot about communicating with, uh, with the farmers there in Africa. Uh -huh. Who's communicating with the farmers in Missouri about improving pollinator habitat that will benefit them and their culture and so forth for the future here? Right. There's, uh, there's actually a number of initiatives right now that you may or may not be aware of. Missourians for Monarchs, which was started actually just about two years ago, has now morphed into a broader coalition. Uh, which includes the commodity growers, includes NGOs, um, actually includes the agribusinesses too, because they also have a stake in it too, whether they feel they're greening themselves, but their practices also affect long-term agriculture. As Scott mentioned, the, the Keystone Monarch Collaborative, more nationwide, there's also the Keystone Honeybee uh, Health Coalition. These are where we actually have farmers at the table too. And, and to give you a quick example, the first meeting we had for the Honeybee Health Coalition um, was, I don't know why, in December in Keystone, Colorado, it was minus 12 degrees. Why you have a honeybee meeting there, I have no idea. But I was sitting next to the uh, representative from the Soybean Growers Association. He had no idea that bees could benefit soybeans. Even with the previous research that had been done, which has been shown here, so now they're actually funding additional research. So even though it's not necessary, but you are increasing your yields. So having them at the, uh, the table and the corn growers. Corn growers, they don't need pollinators, but what they do and how their growing practices is going to affect them. And it's also a man, an idea of individual farmers, as was mentioned here. You may not have the larger organizations that uh, may be espousing one way or another, but farmers tend to listen to what another farmer does. So if you can get one farmer to do it, um, in our first Monarch meeting at Iowa State, uh, one individual farmer who was part of the Corn Growers Association, he committed to putting in milkweed into a system. One problem he had, he couldn't find the milkweed because we're all buying it up to him for everybody else. But by him doing that, other people see, oh, you're not losing yields, you are still making money, but you're also creating a benefit for wildlife too. So there are some initiatives right now, um, MDC, uh, DNR, uh, we're putting together more educational information to disseminate, and we are trying to develop outreach programs for um, local farmers and local communities in a variety of venues, whether it's with groups like Pheasants Forever or the ag businesses, the commodity growers, or the NGOs like St. Louis Zoo or Xerxes Society. Thank you. I think we have time for one or two more questions. Uh, I see There's a couple up there. there in the back. Uh, anyone else? Hi, thank you for coming today. I work with um, neonicotinoids and researching its behavior in soils. 
And so I was wondering, you mentioned one pesticide that they were using there, in, or insecticide, excuse me. I was wondering kind of what type of insecticide they're using, maybe how they're applying it, and yeah. um, if we're seeing uh, neonicotinoid use there, or kind of what the climate of insecticides is. Um, I know neonicotinoids have been uh, promoted in places like Kenya. Um, it hasn't been that prevalent. There are other systemics like the, the dynadem, uh, fungicides. The one that actually got probably the most press that we heard about here was furidan, um, which is an incredibly toxic uh, insecticide, which is banned. It's used in the EU, very limited use here in the United States, but had been readily available in Kenya, and it could be bought over the counter. In that particular case, and this is also one reason we're also looking at pesticides, because there are sometimes secondary uses which we don't tend to think about here. So the Maasai were actually using them to lace cattle that had been killed by lions to kill lions. So you had this major die-off of lions due to this easily and readily accessible insecticide. The company that makes Furidan has now been working with um, the Kenyan government and local individuals and have pulled most of the market, so it should be much more limited. But this is also a, a major issue of the secondary market for things. So if people aren't sure of even, if you're spraying your tomatoes two to three, you know, every two to three weeks, um, you may not realize how toxic it is to everything else. So it's an education component about those pesticides. We are still learning all the different insecticides, and it also varies depending upon parts of the country, too. Uh, talking to my colleague, Dino Martins, he says if you look at uh, northern Kenya where they have organic agriculture, he says basically some of those look like a nuclear waste zone. They've basically leveled every other plant so that there's no potential insect pests, and then basically put giant yellow uh, tacky strips around the entire uh, plot to catch anything that goes in. But it'll also catch birds and everything else. It's organic, you're not using chemicals, but it's also an incredibly harmful way of doing agriculture. So it's a learning process for us, and it's one that we're going to be working with, with the Kenyans. OK, are there any more uh, questions or comments for, for Ed Spivak? OK, I think yeah. I see one. Right. Is, that, <laughs> is that right, way in the back? Yeah, all right. I think that, that'll be our last question. Um, you mentioned the knowledge that, that you all have shared with the Maasai, and I wondered if there's any knowledge that they have shared with you in terms of their, their own practices. Um, I, to me, I think one of the most eye-opening aspects was how much they cared about the survival of their people and their culture. When you meet people like um, Ole Le Pau, he's not really thinking about bees, but what can we do to help his people? That, I think, was, to me, the most eye-opening. How do we maintain that culture? And when you start looking long-term, you know, 10 years, 20 years down the road, um, it's an incredibly, to me, a rather awe-inspiring and somewhat daunting task, too. To give you how daunting it is, uh, Mr. Oleta Powell actually gave me a Maasai name. And my name in Maasai is Ole Saruni. Ole Saruni means one who saves people. That is incredibly tough to live up to <laughs> from an initial you know, point of view, but it's something that, you know, this is the way that they're thinking about really the benefits of these bees, and that's the way we're looking at it. They're looking at the role of pollinators as a way that they can use to save their people, to maintain their culture. And that's what I thought was one of the most awe-inspiring and eye-opening parts of it. And that's, what I think, our biggest takeaway, because they really care, so we also need to really care. Thank you. Thank you.